I'd also like to show my respects and acknowledge the Bedigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm located today at the University of New South Wales and to the elders past and present. And I invite you to do the same for the land on which you are located on in the chat or otherwise. Um, now, we couldn't have a more apt topic um, for our third session in this Challenges for a Cyber Physical World series. As uh, some of you will probably know that yesterday, the Productivity Commission released its final report relating it to its inquiry in the right to repair. And well, while we're still waiting for that, for those of you who haven't seen that, what I'm gonna do is I am actually gonna put a link to the Productivity Commission's report in the chat, the final report, um, so that if you would like to see it, I mean, it's a reasonably long report, but they do have quite a useful executive summary of recommendations and um, which is very useful. Um, so again, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we'll go through all three speakers today and they've promised me a seamless transition through all three speakers. <laughs> um, but I'm sure you'll forgive them if technology defeats that intent and purpose. Um, and we're, they're expecting to speak for about 35 to 40 minutes and we'll have some time for questions at the end. However, we will, we'll leave questions to the end, but um, in terms of answering them, but please feel free to put your questions in the chat at any time so you don't forget them. And at the end of the speakers, I'll sit there and look through the chat and we'll pick out the, the um, all the questions if we have time, but if not, the ones that make most sense to be asked in this context. Um, so I'll do some quick introductions and then we'll get on with the show. Um, we have um, Professor Matthew Kearns, who's the current convener of the Environment and Society Group in the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture at UNSW. Um, and his research sits between the fields of science and technology studies, social and cultural geography and contemporary social theory. We also have with us Roberta Pala, who is a Scientia PhD candidate in the Social Policy Research Centre at UNSW. Um, and we have Associate Professor, Science, sorry, Scientia Associate Professor, Dr. Paul Munro, who's a DECRA Research Fellow um, and specialises in the politics and policies of energy transitions in the global south. So, and then of course me, my name is Kayleen Manrang and I'm the chair of the session today, but you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from these guys. So I'll hand over to the team, thanks. Thanks, Kayleen, and it's great to be here. And I'll, I'll add my acknowledgement also to the Bidjigal people of the Aura Nation, uh, which is where I'm based today. And, um, and, and I'm sure those of you on the call will join me in that acknowledgement as well. Um, I'll share my slides. This was working a second ago. Uh, now it's stalled. Here we go. Um, and I'm tempted to say, look, the, the Productivity Commission report is about 350 pages. So if people on this call can quickly digest that over the course of the next 30 minutes, we can possibly have a conversation about it, right? Um, all right, I hope, hopefully you can all see that now. Um, so thanks, Roberta. And as, I, as, as Roberta mentioned, um, I'm joined by my colleagues, Roberta and Paul. This is work that's um, uh, part of a, a, a body of work emerging from the Allens Hub, um, which, you're, which I hope you're all familiar with, which is obviously connected with law and technology sorts of issues. So we're really thinking about rights to repair uh, in in that sort of context. And, and broadly speaking, bringing together uh, folk in, in both a socio-legal sort of context, but also in a, in a wider kind of um, a social science sort of community, you know, you're really thinking about repair and repair practices. So I guess the, the animating question for today's presentation, which we perhaps will get to across the, the, three, the three speakers and also hopefully in the Q&A, is how do we bring together um, the, the material practices of repair in the context of a, of, a, of a debate about enacting a right to repair or rights to, to repair uh, in, in consumer and IP law. So um, we are, the three of us are not, are not lawyers, but we are, we're hopefully touching on some, um, some legal issues uh, today, but also hopefully kind of widening the scope of the, the discussion to, to also think about how this, this quite technical sort of debate at times 
might might be set up in such a way that it, um, it enables uh, what we understand as the, as the material and situated practices of repair. Uh, so to begin with, what a time to be thinking about the right to repair. As Kayleen said, the, the, the Productivity Commission report uh, landed yesterday. This is a, um, uh, a process that uh, has, I, I think it's about a year and a half into this process now. Um, the final report obviously has been with government for a little while, much like you know our current ARC grants that are probably still with government somewhere, uh, and it has just been released back, back to public. So there'll be a lot of um, sort of conversation over the next couple of weeks, uh, I guess, picking up on the product, you know, on the recommendations in particular. So this is just one that, uh, you know, I copied literally four hours ago from the ABC as, as a kind of first pass in, in, in some of that coverage. And there'll be, uh, uh, you know, I'm guessing some really con uh, interesting commentary uh, from a range of voices um, ar around what, what a right to repair in, in the Australian context may, may look like. Um, kind of casting our, our eyes back a little bit, um, Two, two, I think, interesting um, kind of voices in, in, in the right to repair that you don't often hear speaking together. Um, so the first on the left here is you know, a former presidential candidate in, in for the US Democratic Party, you know, uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren, you know, probably regarded as being on the left of the Democratic Party, um, you know, advocating as part of her, uh, of her unsuccessful pitch uh, to become the, uh, the, the Democratic nominee for, for, for president, a, a, a position around the right to repair, that farmers should be able to repair their own equipment and strongly supporting a national right to repair. And that was you know, taken up as part of her platform, very much obviously centered in the, in the area of agricultural machinery. And this has been a real space for, for, for advocacy around, around the right to repair in particular, and, and, and thinking about uh, the, the, the emerging Kind of worlds of precision agriculture and 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 the rights of farmers to to tinker with their tractors. At the same time, you know, the, you know, the U.S. Farm Bureau, you know, not not necessarily regarded as a uh, massively left wing organisation, shall we say, uh, uh, very much a you know speaking from a from a fairly mainstream agricultural perspective. Again, uh, with with a lot of background kind of negotiation within the, the U.S. Uh, sort of farming community and agricultural policy community more generally, uh, adopting a position that that's advocating a right to repair, particularly around uh, uh, around agricultural machinery for obvious reasons. With with much of this conversation centering on on, on John Deere, you know the world's uh, major uh, uh, you know, manufacturer of farm equipment, and and increasingly in the business of precision agriculture. Uh, so really interesting that, that right to repair brings together disparate voices from from the left and and the right, if we want to think in those kind of political terms. But 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 you know speaking speaking across uh, different kind of interests in interesting sorts of ways. Again, thinking thinking a bit more close to home. Again, right to repair speaking in really you know with different voices and and, and being picked up in different ways. Uh, in the Australian context, so Shane Rattenbury in uh, in the ACT, uh, you know, a, a member of uh, the ACT Greens, articulating in a speech a couple of years ago now that the, that the right to tinker with stuff, the right to get it fixed, to change it, improve it, is sort of an essential kind of criteria of kind of product ownership, but also of emerging ideas around circularity and, and uh, environmental stewardship. Uh, at the same time, th thinking here with um, Josh Frydenberg, you know, current federal treasurer. Uh, this is this is the terms of reference for the Productivity Commission report. You know, very much advocating, uh, you know, a not dissimilar understanding of, of a right to repair, uh, albeit I think with some some important differences, uh, and and it, with some more kind of obvious kind of um, uh, uh, boundaries here in terms of its its articulation. But but really thinking here about the scope for introducing rights to repair for consumers in particular in, in, in particular sort of industries. Well, we'll go on and talk about the Productivity Commission process uh, in, in a bit more depth in a few minutes, but I think what this what this shows us is that there is a, a gathering public conversation around uh, around right to repair issues. And I think at the same time uh, uh, that this is being kind of led by and, and propelled by a, a broader right to repair movement that 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 Kind of brings together, you know, people in, involved in tech, people involved in agriculture, people involved in repair, people involved in environmental sort of thinking. So it really brings together a, a, a really interesting, diverse, somewhat curious coalition of, of actors, um, all sort of 
uh, operating around around the idea of what, what what does it mean to own and and to and to uh, and to repair products and 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 then, and then what are the barriers to repair and, and and how might those barriers be addressed uh, through you know, through uh, through legislative and and uh, through regulatory set of means. So the question that I think we'll uh, I hope we'll, we get to is is how might this this conversation which is which appears as as both a form of activism. But also as a, as a as a as a as an area of kind of legal reform, how might this that these two areas speak to each other, and then how might that also then speak to uh, uh, the, the the actual practices of, of how repairs are conducted? So what, what what's happening in the in in the kind of activist space or the or the or the or the right to repair movement space? Is a, a kind of an emergent sort of activist community, a, a set of practitioners. And if you're interested in YouTube, you can you can go onto YouTube right now, and there's whole channels devoted to to tech teardowns, and uh, there's whole YouTube personality sort of figures that, that operate in that kind of space. And I teach some of this material, and my students were um, you know pointing out different different figures that they are interested in. That, that you know, whenever there's a new phone release, they they buy the new phone and quickly quickly to tear it apart and and figure out how to how to put it back together again. So this this is a really interesting kind of space that's gathering together uh, a whole range of sort of actors in this space. You'll note here that this repair manifesto is uh, published by an organisation called iFixit, who are um, a new, really interesting organisation involved in in advocacy, involved in open source software development, but also involved in uh, in selling uh, 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 you, know, uh, you know repair kits into uh, you know this emergent marketplace. Uh, Thinking here also with with people people in, in fields uh, such as you know so this, this is Andrew Russell and Lee Vinsel, um, sort of historians of technology, uh, kind of figures close to the fields that um, that I work in and Roberta works in in particular, really kind of advocating the value of maintenance as a as a kind of somewhat forgotten set of social capabilities. There's a, there's a there's a parallel body of work that comes out of feminist uh, kind of analyses of technology that talks about the, the the notion of repair and maintenance as a as an often sort of obscured you know set of capacities, and here what 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 Russell and Vincent are articulating is a is a kind of almost a manifesto for maintenance and and really switching around how we think about technology from a focus on innovation to a focus on maintenance. So. It, as I suggested, that a focus on maintenance provides opportunities to ask questions about what we really want out of technologies. So, so really shifting the, the the conversation about technology to, to one of kind of uh, you know the, the sort of desired outcomes and processes of innovation, rather than seeing innovation as itself and necessarily a, a good in its in itself. So in the second part of the conversation in, in our presentation today, we'll be thinking about. Uh, repair practices in the in the off-grid solar market and I think what what we see in that kind of case is a is a really interesting kind of example of this thinking so rather than seeing the 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 rollout of off-grid solar as necessarily good in itself as necessarily a, a form of innovation actually seeing in that in that in that in that innovation process real needs to attend to questions of maintenance and repair and and indeed waste uh, as an outcome of that process Okay, what I haven't spoken about, but perhaps perhaps we might come to in the in the um, in the Q and A's. In addition to the Productivity Commission report, you may have seen over the last um, couple of weeks, the, the Apple Corporation has also made some announcements about offering uh, repair kits uh, and and self service kind of uh, tools and, and and manuals to to um, people that are interested in purchasing the latest Apple iPhone. Uh, the the, the Fairphone, again, a, 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 an ethically uh, manufactured uh, mobile phone, made it onto the Guardian's uh, gadget of the year <laughs> list, which is a sort of an ironic outcome if we think that people should perhaps buy less gadgets. Uh, so these are all things we, we perhaps return to in the in the Q and A. But what we what we'd like to do for the remainder of the presentation is to summarise two um, kind of parallel pieces of work that we've been engaged with collectively and in, uh, in different kind of formats. One thing we've been spending some time doing is, is doing a close analysis of public submissions to, to the Productivity Commission inquiry process. So 
um, and, and Roberta will, will take take that on in a few moments. Um, we're really trying to get a handle on the the way in which the 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 debate in Australia about the right to repair is configured and the way in which repair is defined and and the, and the way in which repair presences some forms of relationships with technology but also to, can obscure others. And then we'll, we'll turn in the second part of the presentation to, uh, to Paul who'll be taking us through uh, our work in, in Southern Africa looking at repair issues in the off-grid solar market. Roberto, I might give you control now. Great. Thanks, Roberta. Okay, thank you thank so you. much. Um, yes, yeah, so our work has been to... Um, oh, wait, I'll check the slides if they're working. Um, if not, I can just do yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I do have control, but... Uh, okay. Did you do that? I did, uh, yeah, ah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, so maybe, yeah, you'll do, it's just fairly straightforward. So if you can do that for me, that'll be good. Sure. Um, okay, so uh, thank you so much, Matt and Kayleen. Um, so yeah, our work has been to track the debate around the right to uh, repair in Australia, looking at the Productivity Commission consultation. And here I focus specifically on the public submissions sent to the Productivity Commission. Uh, to understand what they say about this debate in Australia and how, uh, what interests are at stake. Um, the initial submissions were overwhelmingly in favour of the right to repair and out of 146 submissions, uh, 116 uh, were in favour and only 26 uh, against. Um, those in favour, you know, um, consisted of, of a lot and quite a, a wide range of stakeholders. Mostly uh, we had consumers and repairers and prosumers or advocates speaking on behalf of wider groups uh, like farmers or uh, small businesses and family enterprise. Um, and uh, those that instead were against are less in numbers but represent big portions of the Australian economy and um, these were mostly big manufacturers, uh, suppliers and industry associations. Um, they do carry a lot of weight and, ex and they explicitly declared that in, um, in these submissions to, in to influence the economy. Uh, and it was also clear that there was a coordination of responses between um, some of these figures, um, presenting therefore sort of like a united front to the Productivity Commission. Um, and um, this was especially clear in the household appliances sector, where the, there was the Australian Water Heating Forum, the Australian Industry Group, um, the Consumer Electronic Associations of Australia, uh, and the Gas Appliance Manufacturers Association of Australia, plus different specific companies, so like um, LG Electronics and um, RIM or DAX, they all sort of referenced each other in the different submissions, um, again, as a way to convey the message that there was a sense of the whole industry being behind um, the, these arguments against the, the right to repair. Um, so next slide, the, the arguments are against where um, all a version of one or more of these Either we are not aware of any barriers to the right to repair and protections are already in place, or um, our industry is very unique, uh, our products present unique characteristics and therefore you know, should remain excluded from the inquiry. Um, the, there is also the, um, uh, some arguments about the fact that this is not really an issue of the right to repair, but more an issue of customers or, or consumers not being able to um, take responsibility on how they use or misuse um, the product. And so, um, and, and the last reason or argument was that there are already green solutions um, and recycling programs and sustainability initiatives and therefore you know, somehow these companies were already involved in this work and, and therefore there was no need to intervene on the right to repair as if those things were sort of the same or complementary. Um, the, then there were sort of different articulations of the debate depending on the field. Um, and that's the next slide. Um, these distinctions are 
you know, sort of, uh, so depending on the field, uh, I'll go through this fairly quickly, but um, I'm happy to go back um, later in, if you have any questions. Um, so one was definitely the agricultural field. Um, there is um, definitely, and also we saw it in the, in the report that came out yesterday, um, the Productivity Commission said that there is evidence that manufacturer restrictions um, on, uh, on the access to agricultural repair supplies are causing harm. And um, there were quite a few submissions from farmers explaining that especially during uh, harvest period, um, you know, not being able to have some equipment or to repair some equipment can result in thousands of dollars uh, in lost production. Um, so Mm, there is definitely a sense that the market uh, for machinery repairs is, is dominated by big manufacturers and by the suppliers of these uh, specific brands. Um, then um, in the household appliances uh, sector, one this was definitely one of the most uh, discussed and also brought together a lot of the electronics sort of concerns. Um, there were more uh, actors involved compared to the agricultural um, field and um, the, the issues raised um, yeah, were mostly about ideas of safety and risk uh, or um, definitions of what is a genuine fix. Um, and uh, there's, there's, a, there's a narrative around the relationship between the consumer or in general us and uh, the technology. So there were a lot of emphasis on ideas of responsibility uh, those that are pro the right to repair would say uh, there is too much responsibility on the consumer to either, you know, take care of the object and the product or to um, to raise concerns about issues in the in 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 the repair um, market. And on the other side, those that are against would say consumers are you know, able to to handle any these type of responsibilities and that any type of regulations will always be some t somehow worked around. Um, there was also emphasis on interesting definitions of ownership um, and um, many consumers would claim that because uh, I own a product, I purchased and I own a product, I should also have the right and the possibility to repair it the way I want. Um, there were calls for better designs and designs for longevity or for um, uh, for yeah for for longevity or for repair, um, and many also brought environmental concerns and issues around uh, waste management. Um, there was also an idea of yeah sort of um, a nostalgia for all the times where um, you know there were easier machines that could be more easily. Uh, repaired and um, yeah, the feeling that somehow we're losing that type of um, sensibility towards uh, towards this pro product or um, and the possibility to take care of them uh, on our own. Um, the next slide it's um, about the information and communication technology field. Um, this was another very very discussed field. And here, the opposition between manufacturer versus consumers um, is even clearer, uh, with big companies having more power to limit or completely impede the third party repairers to do any work on devices um, and more po power to control the life of the product. Um, and the, the, the claim, those that claimed. Um, Sorry, those that were against the right to repair claimed that due to the complexity of the devices and the complexity of repairs, you know, this is a unique field that requires um, either exemptions or some a singular focus. Um, and um, the focus, and, and then there was a um, sort of like an emphasis of the right to repair as a balance between right and the risk. So the, the keywords were always like risk management uh, and security. Um, and that created a specific framework of, of repair, I guess. Um, then the ne in the next slide, there were a few other two sectors that um, came up quite, 
quite a bit. One was the, the watches and jewelry field. Um, but here we only found, found repairers uh, or associations of repairers that, that brought up the issue. Um, they mainly focus on the fact that um, manufacturers are com completely controlling the repair market. Um, and most of these repairers claim to have been interesting. They claim to have been trained by the manufacturers themselves, but they're still treated as unskilled repairers. Um, and therefore, they, they're not given any access of, or information um, to, to make these repairs um, because they, they are independent repairers and not necessarily linked to these manufacturers anymore. And then the automobile field um, that presented more neutral language and arguments. And, and here there was a strong reference to the, to the long history of lobbying um, of the industry for more equitable access to manufacturers' repair information. Um, and um, yeah, so this will be the, the, the different fields that sort of came up. Um, but in, through an initial analysis, um, that's the next slide, um, we noticed that repair is configured as an individual issue of consumer rights in terms of warranty clauses and industry interests. Um, the, the relationship, um, there's a focus on the relationship to the product that it's either of ownership or um, on the fact that needing repair is understood as something requiring regulations and protection because part of the market, so because it is marketized. Um, the debate is driven by sectors and the different interests at stake for each actors um, in the different sectors and not uh, as a general disposition toward or, or attitude toward um, repair practices. Um, the actors involved are all defined in terms of their role in the market. So you have consumers, manufacturers, suppliers, repairers. Um, and I think that says something about the specific framework that this debate works with um, and the other forms of relations with technologies that might remain unseen um, or, and left out uh, of these conversations. Um, there was definitely a sort of like a technocentric implications or framing. Um, and by that, I mean that repair is framed as, um, you know, as a specific technical relation to the product. So, it, you know, you, it's something you need to have expertise for, specific tools, specific information to be able to carry out. And that's how it was um, defined. Um, and definitely something that came up a little bit was a, a, a sort of like a gendered component. Um, in the sense of the nostalgia that I was talking about before, you know, of the times where things could be done manually and people would be able to repair and build. Um, and um, these came across as, you know, very gendered ideas and uh, somehow, and, and the idea that somehow, somehow obstacles to repair practices could be perceived as endangering uh, some ideas of masculinity. Um, and finally, um, we have a few questions that are working, we're working with um, just to, you know, to see where we're going with our uh, with, uh, thinking. Um, definitely repair work is not new. Um, and so something that is interesting would be to figure out why uh, it's emerging now as an issue. Um, repair work has been made invisible classically, um, you know, it, it's an informal practice, independent, often, you know, domestic um, and taken for granted. And so why and what aspects are now becoming visible um, and why is it coming up as a, as a, as a right? So as a, something individual and related to consumer ownership. You know, there are specific biases and assumptions or social and political expectations that are uh, attached to uh, framing repair as as a right. Um, and so it will be interesting, going back to what I was saying before, to think about what other forms of repair, you know, non-marketized, informal, independent, local, outside regulations are left out. Um, you know, there are sides of, econo of the economy where repair um, is framed as an issue of care. And this did not come up uh, in the public submissions at all. Um, and 
So the, the right to repair seems to be leaving some of these practices out of the conversation. And, uh, you know, feminist scholars, as Matt was saying before, have shown that repair and care um, have long been overlooked uh, practices because they are normally unpaid and associated with, you know, domesticity or the, um, with the feminine. And so the right to repair debate seems to be either regendering, um, you know, the, the relationship with these technologies and, and and practices of care and maintenance as it leaves out, you know, a type of labour that continues to, make, to be invisible in the debate. Um, and so a question that we might ask would be to imagine what would happen if those sectors were brought to the fore in these discussions and how that would impact um, the way we're thinking about these relationships and, and, and this this right to repair. Um, and now I'm going to pass it on to Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roberta. OK, I'm going to jump on and talk about another thread of research as a, I guess, a group that we've been involved in by talking about a specific piece of technology in a specific geography and how questions of repair are increasingly becoming a, an important debate. But, but in many ways, operating in different ways than it's happened to the right to repair debates in Europe, North America, Australia, how these debates are merging are slightly different. And what I'm mainly actually going to do is actually show a video from our research. It's about eight minutes long. But before I jump into that, I'm just going to give a bit of a context. So, so the object I'm talking about is that they're up in the top left of the screen. Um, so off-grid solar power technology. Um, which has really emerged in the past decade to seeing as a, as a form of technology to solve what is often framed as the energy crisis in Africa, or specifically the electricity access crisis. And, and you'll see a range of kind of images or graphs or, or, or maps like this that kind of show grid electricity connection rates in, this, in Africa or sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see how there's kind of variance around the countries, but, but many countries have below 50% of the population directly connected to the grid. And, and so very much you often see this kind of framing in the past decade, particularly with the dropping price of photovoltaic technologies and kind of the increasing creation of these products that you see on the screen as, as kind of a solution. You know, we, we can kind of solve this issue by leapfrogging a little bit like the landline phones with the mobile phones. It's kind of the same with energy. We can leapfrog the, the grid electricity and have these new technologies. Um, and so what we've been looking at in this project, among other things, is actually looking at kind of what's the, what's the questions around repair around these. Um, and, and a little bit of the backstory about off-grid solar in Africa. Um, Matt, can you click me on the next slide? Yep. Um, so this is just to show you what has happened since 2009. So that, that this graph is about sale of off-grid solar products in sub-Saharan Africa. So basically, these, these little products that you see at the top there were almost non-existent um, prior to 2009. And then there's just been this huge boom. Um, jumping to about 8 million products um, in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, up to over 12 million in 2019. Um, and it's kind of continued to grow. And this is, this is actually just the, the region of East Africa. So there's kind of a broader African market and there's a broader global, global South market and, and a boom of these products. I mean, often they're broken down into kind of two discrete categories. Um, the orange in the graph represents what are known as generic products, which you can kind of see in that little video that was on the bottom left. And these are kind of sold in, in, in um, along the sides of roads and electronic goods stores all across markets in sub-Saharan Africa. And they're kind of very informal networks kind of, and it's, it's kind of a byproduct of, of the boom in trade between Africa and China. And then on the other side, the, the one that's shown in blue on the graph are these branded off-grid solar products made by companies that are usually based um, or have their founding in, in North America and um, European Union. Um, and they have a very kind of specific ways of selling their products through startup companies. Um, and if you click to the next side, so these, these latter branded um, products have attracted a huge amount of investment in terms of um, supporting their spread. So, so basically no investment pretty much from before 2010. And then after that, we see a range of equity um, and debt investors getting involved in this sector. And so these investors are mainly European and North American based. It includes people like Tesla, it includes companies like Total and Shell. It includes Swedish pension funds. It includes family businesses that have impact investment arms. There's this kind of complicated range of different 
entities get involved in financing these startup companies in Africa. The idea that they're going out into the markets and finding a way to sell these products on bulk. I mean, and very much early on, it started with the lamps and, and the solar home systems. Um, but increasingly, these companies are now selling kind of television packages to household uh, across sub-Saharan Africa. And, and really, you know, there was an extraordinary, you know, amount of kind of increasing investment between particularly between 2014 and 2016 so there's really kind of huge expectations that this would not only help solve the energy issues or access in africa but also that lots of money could be made in the process so there's a kind of a you know making money while doing good kind of framing around it um next slide matt uh, but what we're kind of particularly interested in is actually click it one more time i think there's one more image to come up that's on on animation yep so so what we're particularly interested in is well, what are the implications of this boom in terms of waste um and, and particularly one of the reasons why this kind of broader um anxieties around is, is a lot of these products actually have quite short short shelf lives the longest warranties you'll find are one year many have no warranties um, and most of these products only tend to last about two to three years so what we've got this kind of you know people need to go out there and, and rebuy the electricity infrastructure and so, so there's kind of a question about what happens to these products um, and, and kind of in, in terms of the challenges, in terms of repair, um, a lot of these companies, particularly the starter companies, operate with what is known as closed proprietary hardware systems. So basically you can see there's the Sun King there. That Sun King television will not work with a D-Lite solar power system. Um, they have their own cables, but they've also got their own digital handshakes. Um, and so that way the companies can you know, sell initial a lamp, then a solar home system, and keep upgrading it and kind of trap consumers in their, their kind of product ecosystem. A little bit like Apple does and Android, do, you know, different companies. So they operate this as a model to kind of capture customers in increase customers but what that does it reduces the ability to make these products have a second-hand market and therefore increases the issues of, of products falling to disrepair need to be repaired or can't move on in other ways um, the third one is black box technologies so if you have that little image in the middle down the bottom there so most of these companies and most of the the about two billion in funding that's come through all that investment i showed is for this tech known as pay-as-you-go solar so almost all these systems have these little chips inside of them the the branded products um, so people buy a solar power system with a deposit, they take it home, it gives them energy for a week. And then after a week, they need to make a payment with their mobile money. If they don't, there's a little chip within the system that shuts it down. And then the system won't work again until they put um, more credit on it. So it's a little bit like a prepaid mobile, it's a prepaid solar power system. Um, and usually they keep doing that till they pay it off or, or some companies own just basically a rent to use model. So basically the, the infrastructure is owned by the company and people just continually pay a payment, exactly like a, a paid meter system for the solar power products. And but the problem with that to protect this kind of FinTech or this technology inside of it, a lot of these companies use proprietary screws, they weld things shut, they make it very hard to open and access the technology to kind of protect their, their financial technology model, which is based on it. Um, distributional ge geography so, so a critical um, challenge for things like recycling is that you know this is, th these products are supposed to go to quite remote rural communities. Companies struggle to get those products out there um, to try and get them back then afterwards when they need to be repaired or, or recycled is, is a huge logistical financial challenge um, beyond the scope of many. Um, and then finally, it's a very indebted sector. So most of these companies are not yet profitable. They've all attracted some of them more than 100 million, 200 million US in, in terms of funding and debt funding and equity debt funding. That debt needs to be paid off. And so right now, these companies have had this imagine of making lots of money. And there's this kind of asymmetry of power where they actually now you find these companies kind of losing their initial mission of kind of solving energy poverty to, to kind of really thinking about profitability. And that's why we see the boom of televisions and other products where it's, it's shifting towards a middle class market. But that also means that there's less kind of scope or movement for the um, companies to kind of address solar waste. It's an extra cost that they cannot afford um, at this stage, they claim. Um, so what I'm going to, oh, next slide, please, Matt. So what I'm going to do now is um, to show a quick video of, of a research project we did last year. And particularly what we're interested in is actually, well, what happens to these solar products when they eat to the end of their lives? No one really knows. There's just been this boom, increase across Africa. You saw that graph, you know, but there's obviously a wave of, of waste coming in its path. And so what we wanted to do with this project was to kind of track some of these projects in, in a case study country of Malawi and kind of understand the social life of, of waste that was happening in Malawi. Um, some of you might be aware that um, there was the COVID-19 pandemic for the past couple of years, which, which created a challenge for this project. So we actually worked quite remotely with WhatsApp, with research teams on the ground. 
um, in, in, in Malawi, Mizuzu University and Zoo Energy. Um, and we got some funding from the Digital Grid Futures Institute here at UNSW. And we did a bunch of kind of, you know, and we also worked with a remote film crew to create this little documentary about or little film about what we did. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is kind of show this film and then we can kind of reflect on afterwards about what we learned in terms of what was happening with off-grid solar products and their repair in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and here's fingers crossed that the, the technology works for us. Include sound. All right, give me a shout out if it's if it's not connecting. Last decade, there's been a massive change in terms of the availability of solar products in sub-Saharan Africa. So it was a very niche, rare technology, maybe 10, 15 years ago. But since this time, there's been this boom in sale of little products, from solar lanterns to solar home systems that people can use for lighting and charging phones to, to bigger appliances. Multiple things are at play in driving this boom. I guess on the demand side, you know, people wanting more lighting, but in particular recharging mobile phones was an early catalyst. A lot of people in sub-Saharan Africa do not have direct access to the electricity grid. Solar products have gotten cheaper, lots of investment going into it, and ex rapid expansion of companies in the sector. So it's a high priority because energy is often seen as quite intersectional. You need access to energy to improve health outcomes. You need access to energy to improve education outcomes, reading in schools, access to computers. So it's often seen as kind of a cross-cutting issue energy that's requirement to meet all of the different goals. Solar, you can install it anywhere. On a mountain, you on the boat, on the lake, where wires you can't reach, you can generate electricity. So that flexibility makes solar very ideal for supply of energy. So I can show you some of the products that we supply. The latest on the market is called lithium ion batteries. Value for money is the way to use here. You are talking of minimum 10 years before you come back to me. And I doubt if 10 years I'll be there. Somebody's going to replace it for you. So they are very, very good batteries. You know, the market is flooded with fake products, but that's detrimental to the poor Malawians. They will go to a very cheap system and come after two weeks, it can't sustain its life. They will have lost everything. The poorly regulated nature of the market, of the market in Malawi, means that there's often poor quality of supply of products. Consumers buying those poor quality products, often not having enough information to go about a proper installation within their homes because uh, they feel they can't afford a certified installer. So what we're finding is that households are often learning as they go along in terms of how to actually construct these systems, what type of panel to buy, what type of battery to buy, what type of inverter to buy, for instance. So it's a process of trial and error and a, a matter of buying these components as and when they can afford it. So it's this kind of constellation of components that form a system. So what we're seeing as we're visiting these households is often really DIY jobs in terms of installation. Nini 
chaka sijita jifoja udi nila nila jendasi ili Mbeta yiko nungeke ni maga kwa zetu mtundu Sola, pama tifuta ina matima kosa Ina tikapiti sako kosa si zibira ya The solar boom is, is framed as something positive, and it certainly has helped to increase certain forms of energy access to many in Africa. But if it's quite short lies in terms of how long these products last, then its green credentials might be questioned if they're only lasting one or two years. And therefore the person on the one hand needs to go out and buy the infrastructure, the product again. So there's a continual financial burden despite it being renewable energy. And then the second question is waste. So what happens when people stop using these products? You know, they have different potentially hazardous metals and other things inside. Where does this waste end up? They can leach into the soil, affect agriculture. Kids can play with those products. They can end up at waste sites or landfill. And often you will find that waste sites tend to be closest to the poorest communities. And there's not a lot of infrastructure in Africa to address that issue. Different countries have different capacities and, and different amounts of legislation. South Africa obviously has a much more sophisticated in terms of recycling technologies and ability to control products. Um, but then there's also movement among countries. So a lot of end of life products in South Africa actually end up in other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, in particular in Malawi. And then at the end of lives, these products are, are moving to different geographies. And, and so we found it quite interesting with the traders from Tanzania, which, which locally they're called the wandering Swahilis, is actually they're coming house to house, knocking, asking for batteries and buying them and putting them on the back of trucks and taking them across the border of Tanzania. So we've got these huge flows of, of solar products moving from Southern to Eastern Africa um, with different uses along the chain. Sometimes local repairers can fix them and give them extra lives. So there's this kind of local knowledge that's emerging about how to extend these products once they've broken in two, three years, which I think is interesting that it's a very much organic and local response to addressing the solar waste issue. Zina and Nature from Canada, you take any Sharamid, Marconza, Ronza Gonza, Gonza, Mind Zeta, Masora, Mayanism, the Sora, those Marcos. Business, you know, Gonzimba, my invader, and you then is also Mabila Mam, Mamco, Shock Mabiz, Gonza, Tariba, Magasi, the Amatanzik and my invader. We've identified uh, the repair economy as being a critical part of improving the sustainability of the off-grid solar industry. So how can the re repair economy be uh, encouraged? What incentives can be offered to uh, businesses that are engaged in that space, whether it's through, for instance, access to better spare parts, whether it's through training, whether it's through financing. There needs to be more done also in the upstream of product design. So how can we design products better um, so they can be repaired much more easily? I think it has big implications for the sector that frames itself as being green and producing uh, an ethical good is that it needs to actually consider its afterlives as a part of its um, responsibility to its customers. Are you okay, Paul? Just to just give an indication as to time, we've only got 10 minutes left. So if you could wrap up relatively quickly. Yeah, no, so basically the, the, the last two points in that video were the kind of the wrap up of where this research is going next. So we're interested in working with local repairers and understanding their challenges and what they're doing, but then also the upstream about repairable design with the off-grid solar companies themselves. And that's where we're hoping to move to in the next two to three years. But um, but yeah, but that's it for me. We, we're really interested to hear questions from the audience and, 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 and their thoughts, anything? Thanks, everyone. Unless, or did you have anything final to say, Matt, or you? No, that's that's probably enough for me. We're just dealing, thinking about repair at these at these two different kind of scales, and how to actually think about the connection between these two different articulations of of repair is probably the, the, 
um, what one thing to take away from these two two pieces of work here? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I'm just asking um, now, just to there aren't questions in the chat yet, but if there are, but just to um, direct attention, there is a um, from New Zealand. Uh, there is they haven't. Um, uh, integrated a right to repair yet, but there is actually a petition now to support a right to repair in New Zealand. So thanks very much, Bridget, for that. Um, also, Lyria has pointed out uh, Australian Council of Learned Academies uh, report that it makes some of the same points that um, that Roberta was pointing out as part of her analysis, her and your analysis, Matt, in relation to the um, the analysis of submissions. Now, um, in the absence of questions in the chat, I just wanted to make, uh, I'll take the prerogative of the chair um, and uh, make a comment more than a question. I thought it was really, I, I'm coming from this as lots of people know from the perspective of a legal academic. And particularly in when I look at this uh, law and tech, but also intellectual property, um, which is founded on particular notions of ownership. And I really quite was quite intrigued by the comment by Roberta that saying that everything was grounded in definitions of ownership, that the, the submissions were grounded in, um, a lot of the submissions were grounded in definitions of ownership, particularly consumers' idea of ownership. Um, the reason I found that intriguing was because that for, from, from a legal perspective is very much a Oh yes, well, what is there? <laughs> what else is there in terms of you looking at right to repair? Which is, of course, um, the great thing about your talk was it, of course, led us to places, particularly lawyers, to places where you're going. It's not just about ownership because I really like the way you looked at the concept of where is this, um, where's the the issue of care that you were talking about further along. That this is not just an issue of ownership; it's an issue of well of care around that. And I was wondering if you could actually talk a little bit more about that, Roberta, in the context of your own research or in the context of the submissions. Yeah, sure. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so that's one of the interesting things that we, we really, um, we, we like to, you know, delve into in our conversations about this. Um, really how in the in this context in the debate in Australia and in the Productivity Commission um, there's a specific idea of what repair is and it's related to this uh, very direct and sort of linear clear idea of uh, or relationship to the product you own it and then you know there are different uh, framings of uh, what it means to to actually own it but you know once you purchase it the idea is that you you are entitled to do things with that product, um, among which also to to repair it. Um, but yeah, there there is this really broad um, literature around um, relationships to objects and products and and technologies that is not framed in those terms. That the assumption is not based, or yeah, the 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 grounding of that relationship is not based on that purchasing moment or in that idea that you own that object. So that very individual um, and, and marketized idea of ownership um, and instead broad, broad, broadens it to, you know, ideas of care and maintenance and, um, and even custodianship. I thought that came up in one of the um, academics that sent their public um, their submission. Um, and um, there was this nice distinction, I guess, between ownership and custodianship. And I guess the idea of being a custodian of uh, the product might allow other types of questions in regards to what's going to happen to the product later for, you know, who, who's, um, who's interested are at play. Is it only, you know, the, the specific person using it in, in that moment? Or are there other interests um, at play that um, that might be as relevant to consider? And so it, we're trying to broaden that idea of um, repair that might not be as present in this um, in these submissions. Thank yeah. you, but I, I think. Oh, sorry, Matt. Matt, did you want yeah, to comment? Just a bit on just a bit on what Roberta's 
response in, in a couple in, in two, two specific ways. So uh, another of our collaborators in this work is Bronwyn Morgan, who's done a lot of work in, in the, the sharing economy. And so um, one of the things that I would have liked to have seen the Productivity Commission do, but but we think they probably haven't done in, in, in as full a way as we might have hoped, is think about what the right to repair means in the context of, of, a, of a climate transition. So if, if we are transitioning um, in lots and lots of ways, and, and one of the ways in which that climate transition is being experienced is in different think, modes of thinking about our relationship to products, well, one of the things we would have loved to have seen a right to repair debate take on is, is really what that, what that looks like. And I think that's where the, the case study in Malawi is really one of the ways in which that's really relevant because because it's also thinking about what a, what a, what a climate transition means for, for, for repairability. Um, the other thing which I think comes up there is is the recent announcement by Apple, right? So there's been a lot of debate about the Apple announcement and one of the features of that debate is that there is, in the context of, um, uh, of the right to repair, there's such a centering on the the individual owner or you know user of a mobile phone and a, and and a, and a obviously a pretty smart corporate strategy to sell repair devices into into that market rather than necessarily see this as opening up a a, 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 a mode of kind of engagement with our devices to longer time frames and all the rest of it so one of one of the clips that came out in relation to the apple iphone and also was that they've released repair kits for phones that are that that need the least amount of repair right <laughs> so they haven't opened up a broader uh r repair kind of service for the phone that i've got for example <laughs> yeah thanks very much matt and roberta I, i'd like to point out it's again not a question but a very insightful question a comment from lyria more on the legal side, but it's useful for you guys to get this. This is all supposed to about, be about interdisciplinary learning, saying the, part of the intellectual property challenge is that organisations are worried about trade secrets, which aren't actually really intellectual property, although they're often argued to be. Um, it's about, it's, in the end, it's about keeping corporate secrets via com contract and equity. Um, so the argument is just, we don't want to tell you how it works so we can make more money. Yeah. Um, and th it's something that I've often seen um, tending to obfuscate this idea around this is our intellectual property. Often when you point behind it, no, actually, it's not your intellectual property. It's just something that you've managed to keep secret until now and you want to keep secret so you can make some more money. Um, and that is an interesting part of the landscape where intellectual property ideas come into this particular space. Um, now, are there any other questions or comments or anything else from the speakers before we wind up since we've got two minutes to go? I'll, I'll come back on the IP issue. Mm, um, yeah. So obviously that, that's something we, we, we will need to be really thinking about um, going forward and, and this is an ongoing body of work. Just, just to make one comment briefly is, is, is I think one of the things that's interesting about the current right to repair debate in Australia, and particularly not just the Australian debate, but internationally, is that some of some of the more defensive arguments that have been mobilised um, by major players have have been seen to be then invalidated by by their by announcements around right to repair. So thinking here about consumer warranties and and like the idea that you know tinkering with your phone would void a warranty, for example. Um, so that's a really interesting dimension and feature of this debate. So, so arguments that are initially put forward then are revealed to be um, perhaps, perhaps a bit more complex in practice. So that's that's something to kind of watch and, and it'll be interesting just to, to, to be noting that going forward. But in that context, I think it's really notable that um, the, 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 the current debate in Australia, as, as I think Roberta summarised, is very much centred on very established um, industrial sectors which have quite established repair sectors. So motor vehicles in particular, um, the agricultural sector it, it obviously has a really strong third party in, in independent repair sector. So that's that sense of whether a debate about right to repair um, is, is a pathway to a more general set of um, kind of set of rights for consumers to repair and with their products, I think is a really open question. And I know that we have on a, you know, in the call today, people representing repair cafes. And, and I'm, I'm sure that in in the context of the, the 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 next phase of the debate, what will be likely surfaced, and I hope is surfaced, is is how that the practices of repair 
and people advocating repair really, um, are, 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 whether they feel that their, their, their objectives are being met by the propositions that are, that are being published by something like the Productivity Commission report. Thank you so much, Matt, Paula and Roberta. Paul and Roberta, thank, it's been a great debate. I'm so fascinated. Um, so thank you very much and I will look forward to seeing your further work in this area and thank you from the audience and thank you for the comments. Um, and the good news is that um, this series, Challenges for a Cyber Physical World, is coming back next year thanks to the generous funding from the Allens Hub for Technology, Law and Innovation. So hopefully people will be able to continue to talk with us about these particular issues. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for the comment.